Thank you so much for that introduction and for the invitation to be here. I'm always excited to give talks about my research, um, particularly this project, because uh, since I've started my current project, um, it's been some time since I've talked about this project. So I'm always excited to sort of come back to the roots of uh, my research interest in terms of where I started as a graduate student and seeing this project come to the stage that it is now. So as Prima said, I'm going to be talking about my book, which was published with Stanford University Press last year, Race on the Move, Brazilian Migrants and the Global Reconstruction of Race. And for this project, it was actually one that I started during my time in graduate school. And at that time, I knew that I was really interested in looking at the intersection between race, ethnicity, and migration. Um, because I felt that um, in the U.S. literature, a lot of times the literature on race and ethnicity focuses primarily on the U.S. context and also the literature on migration. But I was really interested in wanting to look at how these things might shape each other when you leave the context of the United States and think about the context where immigrants are coming from. And so for me, I was also interested in looking at how race exists outside of the United States, particularly in other parts of the Americas. And Brazil became my country of focus because during my time as an undergraduate student, I had taken some classes on race in Latin America, and I realized, wow, this is very fascinating to think about race outside of the US context and how different uh, the ways that people think about race are when you leave the US, particularly in other parts of the Americas where there was a similar history of European colonization, uh, African slavery, and also indigenous conquest. But yet the US model of race relations is very different and divergent from issues and, and frameworks of race in other parts of the Americas, particularly within Brazil, where for the last five to six decades, U.S. and Brazilian scholars have often been comparing race in both countries in terms of thinking about racial categories, race relations, uh, experiences of discrimination. But most of that research had focused on Brazilians based in Brazil or Americans in the U.S. using survey data or either ethnographic accounts that separated both of those contexts. And in this particular project, I was interested in comparing race in both countries through the perspective or experiences of people that actually lived race in each context, who had the opportunity, the unique opportunity, to migrate from Brazil to the United States and then to go back to Brazil after living here to see how these people's perceptions of race changed. And that basically essentially became the basis of this project, wanting to explore how conceptions of race move across borders with people as they're on the move across the globe. But in this particular case, looking at the racial perceptions and conceptions of Brazilian return migrants in a small Brazilian city that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about later. And so in terms of thinking about this project, I really wanted to try to bring together those different literatures, not only of race and ethnicity and migration, but also the role of transnationalism and the ways in which transnational process is the ways in which immigrants remain tied to their countries of origin at the same time while living in the host country, how that changes their experiences, the ways that they see the social world around them in various ways, but more, more specifically, with regard to the social construction of race. And so in my book, the argument that I make is that when people migrate, particularly the people that I interviewed in this study, they ended up navigating and thinking about race through what I call a transnational racial optic, which I define as this lens that migrants use to observe, negotiate and interpret race by simultaneously drawing on conceptions of race, not only from the country of origin, but also from the, home, uh, from the host society. And so what happens for these individuals is that as they migrate, when they come to a particular host country, they're bringing conceptions of, them, of race with them 
from their country of origin to help them figure out, well, how does race work in this context of the United States? What does the Latino category mean? How do I figure out where I fit within U.S. racial categories? One, if those categories don't exist in my country of origin. And two, if those categories do exist, like the black and white categories, they have very different meanings for who can be included or excluded within those categories across the different countries. And so what I argue in the book is that migration creates a juxtaposition, juxtaposition of race here and there for these individuals, such that they develop a hybridized lens or way of seeing the world or making sense of the racial world by drawing on the conceptions of race from the country of origin and the host country at the same time. And so for this book and for this project, I draw a lot on the literature from social psychology, which looks at the notion of identity development, particularly with regard to place and context. So there's literature within social psychology that offer, argues that the place in which a person lives plays a very important role in shaping the ways that they see the social world. So thinking about the socialization literature, what are the messages that you get from the environment you're raised in? What are the, how are the ways ways um, that people talk about race. Does race mean skin color or is race tied to a particular group? How does one determine who fits in a particular racial group or category? What are the physical, fe uh, the physical features that are used to determine who's black or white or Pardu or Latino or Brazilian or what have you within a particular context? And then I also draw on the literature on identity salience, which talks about how in particular contexts, when a person has an experience that makes them more aware of their identity, whether it be based on race or gender or social class or any other type of social construction, how that identity becomes activated in a particular moment stays with that individual. Um, in the context of this project, my focus is more on the racial aspect of this and how individuals' experiences living in the United States, experiencing discrimination, being racialized as Latino, um, working and living in residentially segregated communities, how do these experiences then shape what it means for these people to be Brazilian in the U.S. context, what it means to be identified by other Americans as Hispanic or Latino, even though these individuals themselves do not see themselves in that way. Um, and so that's the social psychological aspect of this in terms of looking at how does place and context really shape the way people ascribe meaning, social meaning to race, and how that shapes individuals' lives and interactions. And then I also draw significantly on the literature of transnationalism or transnational processes, which is an area of literature that's developed significantly quite a bit within the last couple of decades. Decades, and it argues that migrants today, people who are on the move across borders, have many more technological advances that allow them to be able to remain connected to their country of origin. So even if you're living in the United States or another host country for five years, 10 years, 15 or 20 years, however many years, there is a way that you can remain connected to your country of origin socially, politically, economically, and in this project, I argue racially that people, the way that people navigate race is also something that can be negotiated transnationally or cross borders as well that allows people to also remain connected to the whole home and the host country at the same time. And so what I find in my research in this particular book, I argue that along the, among the migrants that I interviewed, and I'm going to get into more detail in terms of explaining the context of the study and talking more specifically about the findings, but in terms of thinking about the transnational racial optic, what I found in my interviews with these returned migrants in Brazil is that there were a few factors that influenced the strength of the transnational racial optic for the people that I interviewed. First, the first factor is where the initial racial socialization occurs. Does that happen in the U.S. or does that happen in the country of origin? And so this becomes tied to the age of migration. And within the immigration literature, this is why a lot of immigration scholars often do a lot of research comparing, let's say, first-generation immigrants to their U.S.-born children, or they also ask about, well, what's the age of migration 
Well, at what age do you come to the United States? During your childhood or as an adult? Because in terms of thinking about the social psychological literature, that plays a role in determining which country provides a stronger influence or frame of reference for the individual with regard to the socialization process. And this is uh, not any different for thinking about racial socialization, which country becomes your racial frame of reference. The second factor, what is the social construction of race in the home country, in the host country? Is it very similar or is it very different? So for instance, as I mentioned before, the US and Brazil have often been the basis of these comparative frameworks or comparative studies. Um, and Brazilians find U.S. race relations to be very, very confusing and very different from the context of Brazil. And so if you're coming from a country where race, you may consider race to not be as important and you come to the United States and you feel that you have to figure out what racial category you belong in or you're turning on the TV and you're constantly hearing about issues of race in the media, if that's very different from your country of origin, that's going to play a role in shaping the way that you you think about how race exists here, but also in your home country, these uh, two contexts become frames of reference for each other. The third factor is the role of transnational ties. How often are you remaining connected to people at home? Are you talking to people every day over the phone? Or at that time when I was doing my research, people were actually talking on the phone more. And now it's uh, WhatsApp or Facebook and all of these other uh, technolo uh, all of these other forms of social media that allow people to stay connected. And to what extent do conversations with family members back home about what's happening, either in the context of Brazil or what's happening in the U.S., whenever there are issues of race that are mentioned in the media, whenever there are incidents, and you talk to family members about this, this has a way of shaping the ways that people think about race beyond the United States. So people are hearing about the way race exists here in the United States from family members that live here and vice versa. People that live here are also learning about what's going on in terms of race in Brazil whenever um, major incidents occur there. And so these transnational ties are also important for influencing the ways that people begin to think about race with the transnational racial optic. The fourth factor what is the race or ethnicity of the migrant or how does phenotype play in? In the U.S., race has been very important throughout our history, and it's not only about how people racially classify themselves, but how other people externally classify other people and how folks are treated on the basis of how they're externally classified. So phenotype, what racial group do you look like you're a part of? Um, because um, indirectly, implicitly, or explicitly, that can shape individual social treatment towards individuals. And in the United States, historically, being having a white, quote unquote, white phenotype um, leads less likely to someone experiencing uh, racial discrimination compared to someone who is non-white. And in terms of thinking about the diversity of immigrant populations in the United States, particularly Latinos who have a wide range of phenotypes, even among members of the same ethnic group or nationality, people's experiences might be different based on which end of the scale they fall. And so for the people that I interviewed, the wider looking immigrants had different experiences from the darker uh, Brazilian immigrants that I interviewed in the study. And this also shaped the extent to which they felt that the transnational racial optic was present uh, for them in shaping their conceptions of race. And then finally, going back home. So for a number of the people in the study, before they even came to the United States, they planned to return back to Brazil permanently. They didn't want to make the US their permanent home. And so whether people make permanent returns or temporary returns, a lot of times the literature, the, the, uh, the lack of, I won't say the lack of literature, but the limited research that's been done on return migration often talks about how a lot of times when people immigrate to another country, they don't realize how much they've been changed or how much they become incorporated until they go home, maybe for a short visit, for a vacation, or either they decide to permanently return. And so for the people that I interviewed, going back home to Brazil often evoked a readaptation process that helped them realize I didn't, um, that I didn't think I had become Americanized in any sense, 
until I came back home and maybe started to think about race a little bit more differently than I did before I migrated. And so these are the factors that I argue throughout the book shape the people, the people that I interviewed, their perceptions of race living in the United States and then when they went back to Brazil. And so for the rest of the talk, after I provide some context, I'm going to be drawing on some passages from the book to illustrate each of those factors in action. The book is organized a little bit differently. It goes into much more detail in terms of talking about the particular time periods when people lived in the U.S., their experiences before they migrated, what was it like living in Brazil, then when they came to the U.S., and then when they went back to Brazil. But I'm structuring the talk this way because um, I only have limited time and I think that this is the most concise way for me to uh, explain and demonstrate the argument of the book and the findings. But before I get into that, I just want to provide some context on race in Brazil and the United States, um, because this is not something that people are very familiar with, certainly not the Brazilian context. Um, in this room, I imagine most of us have some familiarity with the social construction of race in the United States, so I likely won't spend as much time on the right side of the chart as I will on the left, but only to provide some key comparisons um, that I think are important for the purpose of the talk. So Brazil and the U.S. are the two largest countries in the Americas, and they have a number of similarities. Both of them are European colonies, um, experienced indigenous conquests, and were two of the largest slaveholding societies in the Americas. Brazil was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery in 1888, which was not very long ago um, when we think about the grand scale of history. Um, and so in terms of thinking about the length in which slavery lasted in Brazil, uh, after the Atlantic slave trade abolished, um, was abolished and prevented new slaves from being brought from Africa, Brazil continued illegally importing uh, slaves um, much later than the rest of the countries in the Americas. And what that did was it led to a much larger African descendant population in Brazil, which is much larger than the one that's in the United States. And a lot of people don't realize that more slaves or, uh, or more Africans were taken to Brazil than to any other part of the Americas. Um, and in Brazil, in terms of thinking about the history of the way race relations developed there, from the very beginning of the slave, uh, of slavery in Brazil and also colonization there, the demographics were a little bit different because it was often single Portuguese men who were uh, going to Brazil to set up the colonies, whereas in the U.S. people came in family units. And so this led to more uh, interracial uh, at times forced, um, for the most part, unions uh, between uh, these Portuguese colonizers and enslaved African women and also indigenous women. And so the history of racial making or race mixing has, has been a very strong part of Brazil's history. Um, and the country has acknowledged that. And this has played a role in the population being much more uh, racially mixed or um, that is a part of the nation's history compared to the United States. In the U.S., we often think about our race relations from the black-white uh, the black -white binary because of the one-drop rule, where the white racial category was fo focused on purity and ancestry. Um, and in Brazil, it was actually the opposite. If a person had one drop of non-white blood, that was basis, a basis to be able to exit from the black category. And so these are two key differences when we think about racial classification in each context, particularly in Brazil, that remains to the present day. And in the U.S., with the growth of the multiracial population, this is starting to shift a little bit. But the black-white binary still remains important for the way we think about race. Brazil's population has been predominantly non-white, um, and people often think about race as something that's most more about skin color and phenotype rather than about ancestry in Brazil. So you can have multiracial or mixed ancestry and still self-classify as white and be seen by as white by other Brazilians, whereas in the U.S. this is typically not the case because ancestry and phenotype have been important for determining one's racial classification. Brazil at one point was thought to be a racial democracy because after slavery ended there, there was a lack of overt government-sanctioned racism on the books, unlike the Jim Crow era in the United States that came into existence pretty much after slavery ended. 
And for that reason, it was thought that Brazil was sort of this racial utopia or this racial model that the world should uh, particularly follow in terms of thinking about how do we get rid of racism because on the surface level, it seemed like everyone was getting along really well in Brazil and you had this population of individuals from very fair skin to very dark and everything in between. And so on the surface level, it looked like things were very good in Brazil. On the other hand, the U.S. has often been thought of as this global model of racism. But in both of these different models, despite these different histories, significant racial inequality has been documented in both contexts uh, between individuals who were lighter or whiter and individuals who were darker or blacker. And so the countries are at these really interesting historical moments because in order to try to rectify that racial inequality in Brazil, about 10 to 15 years ago, Brazil implemented uh, university quotas for their federal universities to increase the number of African descended Brazilians. Um, their enrollment, since their numbers were very, very small relative their, to their size in the Brazilian population. Whereas in the U.S., we've often seen a dismantling of affirmative action programs and arguments at least when I was finishing the manuscript, um, that the U.S. had reached a post-racial moment, uh, particularly given uh, President Barack Obama's election as president, and also in terms of thinking about the demographic shifts, a lot of Americans started to think that race was becoming less salient in the United States, although in recent years that argument um, has started uh, to wane more. And so now I want to talk a little bit about Brazilian immigration to the United States because this is a population that we know very little about. And one of the reasons that I was interested in Brazil not only was because of its history in terms of race relations, but also there's been a stream of migration to, Brazil, uh, to the U.S. from Brazil for the last uh, 40, uh, 50 or so years now, although it's happened in waves. But we still know very little about this population, and even to this day there aren't as many American sociologists doing research on Brazilian migrants. And so these waves of Brazilian migration have shifted depending on what was happening in Brazil. So it informally began in the 1960s, but it really accelerated in the 1980s when Brazil was undergoing a huge economic crisis and political instability. Um, not unlike too much what's going on right now. I don't know how much people have been following the news about sort of the Zika, the Zika issue, uh, the Zika outbreak, the economic crisis, and the Brazilian president is, uh, has been, the, the Congress has voted, or at least the House has voted to impeach the Brazilian president. And so Brazil is a very young democracy, uh, only starting in the 1980s, and there are concerns that this current crisis might lead to an overthrow of democracy in the country, which will likely begin to have some impact on the uh, current migration way to the U.S. or to other um, host countries for Brazilians. And it's really been hard to get a sense of how many Brazilians there are in the United States uh, for a few reasons. The biggest one is that many of them are undocumented. Although they come with tourist visas, they overstay them. And if you're undocumented, you're likely not going to be filling out a census. The other issue is that U.S. racial categories are a huge source of confusion for Brazilians. Uh, Brazilians are not Hispanic, as they're not Spanish-speaking, although most Americans tend to use Hispanic and Latino um, interchangeably. And at the same time, the white and black categories on the U.S. census are similar to the ones that exist in Brazil, but the meanings associated to those categories are different, where the white category in the U.S. is much more exclusive than the white category in Brazil, and the black category in the U.S. is much more flexible or open because of the one drop rule compared to the one in Brazil where fewer people tend to identify as most people are racially mixed and tend to want to classify as Pardu, which is the official census category in Brazil. And so for this reason, it's been argued that Brazilians are an invisible minority. Uh, historically, most of them have been white, working to middle class, more well-educated than the general Brazilian population. Um, and many of them have been male, although over the last couple of decades, or the last decade or so, more, women, more and more women have been migrating to the U.S. And the majority come from this city called Governador Valadares, which after this point I would refer to as GV, because it is a mouthful to say.
and it's an earful to hear, particularly if you're not a Portuguese speaker. And most of these individuals settle in the northeastern United States, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, New York. Um, there is also some smaller enclaves in Georgia and in Florida. And many of these people end up migrating to the U.S. and then going back to Brazil, or at least that's their plan before they even come here. So before they even leave, their mindset is on going back to Brazil. So they already have this transnational mentality before they even come to the United States. And so these are the people that we're thinking about when we talk about Brazilian immigrants and how they might be somewhat different from other quote unquote Latino immigrants in the United States. So in terms of data and methods, here's just more information about where I conducted the research. Um, in Governador Valadares, about 15% of the population is, ex is estimated to be living in the United States. And their goal is to do what is referred to as Fazer a America, which is a process that's referred to as immigrating to the U.S., working here for a number of years to save money, is work as much as you can to save up as much money, and then to go back home to Brazil to buy a car or buy a house or start a business. So again, the migration project for these people is about upward social mobility, but not in the U.S., when they, but when they go back to Brazil. Whereas other Im immigrants who come to the U.S. usually tend to want to stay and establish their lives here. And so just to get a sense of where this place is located in Brazil, it's in the state of Minas Gerais, this laser isn't working, which is north of Rio de Janeiro. And then here is the small city right in the middle of the state of Minas Gerais. And so I just want to show a few more pictures before I start to get into the findings from the project, just to give you a sense of the impact of U.S. migration in this city. So here is a picture of the skyline of GV. And most of the buildings that you see here were actually built with remittances that were sent from the United States over the last uh, 40 or 50 or so years that this migration stream has been going on. This house here was also built by a return migrant. Uh, from the U.S. And if you drive around the city, you will see a number of houses that are built in the architecture of New England. So people actually bring back architectural ideals for creating their homes from the United States when they go back there. And so this is not uncommon to see stores named America. There's like a stop and shop little grocery store, uh, which is the name of a uh, big uh, supermarket chain in New England. So you can see these signs of America in the town. And here I just want to give you an idea of the phenotype of the people. Um, and so in Minas Gerais, particularly, the population of Brazilians there tend to self-classify as Pardu. So when we think about race relations, we often think about race from a national perspective. So we say U.S. race relations or Brazilian race relations. But the demographics and the discourses that people use to talk about race vary depending on the part of the country that you're in. Well, Brazil is very similar in that regard. In the northeastern part of Brazil, that's where the larger black descended or African descended population is from, is that's where the slaves or the Africans were brought uh, during the slavery era. And then in southern Brazil, the population there is wider because that's where a lot of German and Italian immigration happened. Um, in the early 1900s and after World War II. In Minas Gerais, which is somewhat kind of in the middle of the country, the population tends to fall within the middle of what we would think of as the black-white binary in terms of phenotype. So many individuals have a medium brown skin tone, and this is the phenotype that people often think of when they think about Brazilians sort of falling in the middle of this category. And this gives you a sense of what people look like and when they come to the U.S., they have to figure out where to classify here. So for the project, in order to answer my research questions, I ended up conducting retrospective interviews with about, uh, about 49 return migrants and a comparison group of 24 non-migrants who were usually family members of the return migrants because I wanted to see how the process of migration changed people's experiences. And that comparison sample allowed me to do that. Um, here's just a little bit of demographic information. About half of the sample was half and half men and women. People lived in the U.S. for about eight years, primarily on the East Coast. The majority didn't speak any English. 
The majority also came with uh, tourist visas or work visas of some sort, but only about a quarter of them were able to become green card holders or citizens, which is how most people end up becoming undocumented in the U.S. again by overstaying visas. If you have more specific questions about the data and methods, I can talk about that in the Q&A. So to return to the transnational racial optic of these different factors that I argue shape these people's perceptions of race, the age of migration is very important because of the issue of uh, adolescence and that being a key time when identity development happens for people. If you end up migrating to another country after you're adult, your home conference is all your home country is always going to be your primary frame of reference because that's the context that you know the most. That's where you underwent your key identity development. And so this plays a role in shaping which country's racial norms are going to be your frame of reference. All of the people that I interviewed came to the US as adults. So that means that for them, Brazil was the frame of reference for them to be able to figure out how race functioned in the United States. And not only that, the specific context of GV and the localized racial discourses around what it means to be in GV in terms of having this racially mixed phenotype. But also what I found was that people thought that racism was less of a problem in GV compared to other parts of Brazil because the population was more racially mixed. So one of my respondents, Venetia, talks about how racism here is more moderate because we have lots of different types of people compared to other parts of the world, so like the US, or even other parts of Brazil, and he references southern Brazil, which is wider and has more German immigrants. And so this is the framework, or this is the context that shaped the frame of reference that my return migrants had before they even came to the United States, this perception that GV is, uh, in terms of race relations, is a much better place to be, not only compared to the US, but compared to other parts of Brazil. The second factor, the social construction of race in each country. Uh, here I'm just going to talk a little bit about racial classification, which is just one indicator of uh, one of the ways that we can talk about the social construction of race. And what I found in my study among these return migrants that in terms of thinking about racial categories, they had to figure out how each of these categories existed and who they applied to in each particular context. The white category, as I mentioned before, exists on the U.S. Census and on the Brazilian Census. But the people who can be in each category differs depending on the context. So the home and the host context are very different in terms of the white racial category. So one of the participants that I interviewed, she talks about how when she first came to the US, she filled out a census form. And it asked for her racial classification. And when she first came to the US, she said that she put white. But or after some time living here, she said that she realized that being white in the US was very different from being white in Brazil. And she says, I considered myself white, but here, for the Americans, she is not white, because there is a perception that to be white in the US, you have to have very, very fair skin, you have to have blue eyes, and you have to have blonde hair. And hardly any of the people that I interviewed had those physical characteristics, and so they felt like, even though I might be white in Brazil, I'm not white in the US. And interestingly enough, Hinata ends up classifying herself as Latina, not only in the US, but when she comes back to Brazil, this is her racial classification at the time that I interviewed her. And so in terms of thinking about the party category, this was also a source of confusion for people when they got to the US because there is no racially mixed category here. You can check off more than one classification, but there is nothing that symbolizes someone wanting to say, I'm just racially mixed, not checking off specific categories. And then finally, the Hispanic category for Brazilians was also confusing, but it's really the only option that people have living here in the US um, in terms of thinking about um, being of having Latin American origin. So here I just have a couple of charts that show people's racial classifications um, as they recall them before they migrated. So you can see that about half of the sample, half of the people that I interviewed 
thought of themselves as white before they migrated, and about a quarter thought of themselves as brown or pardu. However, when people got to the U.S., or when they lived in the U.S., people recalled classifying themselves mostly as Hispanic or Latino. Even though they did not feel um, that they were Hispanic, they recognized that that's how most other people classified them. So the way that other people classified them had a huge impact on the ways that they saw themselves, particularly after being told by white Americans and other Americans, you're not white here. You don't look white or you're not white the way that we think of uh, the white racial category in this context. And you can see that the white racial classification went down to about 30 percent in the U.S. And so this just goes to show that the different social construction of race in the host country and the home country led to a change in the ways that people racially classified themselves as they internalized what those categories meant in each place. The third factor, whether or not someone uh, is a visible or a non-visible ethno-racial minority. Um, for the people that I interviewed, the white return migrants often told me that coming to the U.S. was a more transformative experience for them in terms of the ways that they thought about race because they went from a context in Brazil where they were in a very privileged category and in the U.S that privilege category no longer existed, at least not in the same way that it did in Brazil. Whereas the black return migrants that I interviewed didn't feel that their perceptions of race shifted as much because they already experienced significant discrimination in Brazil. And so, in addition to phenotype, the differences in phenotype, the individuals had English proficiency and documentation status, so being an immigrant also ended up taking on more salience for these people in addition to the issue of race and ethnicity. And so for this white return migrant I interviewed, he talks about how he noticed that even though he wasn't white in the U.S. the way that he was white in Brazil, that he still experienced some privilege because he was of lighter skin tone within the Brazilian community in terms of his interactions with other European immigrants. So like the Portuguese and the Italians, particularly if he Wanted to, if you wanted to work um, in the U.S. for some of these immigrant populations, then skin color became more important for distinguishing lighter Brazilians for darker Brazilians. And so he talks about how you could feel that this discrimination was discreet, but you knew it was there. And so a lot of times people talked about discrimination in the U.S. as something that if you were particularly a darker immigrant being much more overt, whereas the lighter immigrants talked about it being much more subtle. So again, these differences in the extent to which you negotiate race in these transnational contexts depending on what your phenotype is, whether you're darker or lighter or a visible or non-visible minority. The fourth factor, the strength of transnational ties. So something else that was important was the extent to which people communicated with family members back home, but also even before people came to the U.S., what were they hearing about race in the U.S. before they even came here? What were their conversations like with people who already lived here, um, who were telling them information about what life here was like living in the U.S. And so I found that a lot of people felt that they had been somewhat primed about what race would be like in the U.S. or what their experiences like would be here through their conversations with other migrants that were currently living in the United States or through watching television, uh, through watching American movies, American television shows, which gave people some idea whether or not that was completely accurate or not, but it gave people something to kind of work with before they even came here. And so Camilla, this return migrant, talks about how she heard before migrating that most Americans were white. And that she says you get there and you see that it's different, that it's much more diverse than what you see on television. And you find that if you walk in the streets, you see an Indian person, a Chinese person, a Japanese person, you find all races and there is space for everyone. And so this was different from what she'd heard about race before she came to the U.S. And when she got here, she got to see that the images that she'd seen on television, although they, although they provided some basis for her, 
they were not completely accurate and this ended up reshaping her experiences. And so these transnational ties through either talking with family members or having exposure to race in the U.S. through global media forms also plays a role in the ways in which these individuals that I interviewed started to negotiate and think about race within a transnational framework or racial optic. And then lastly, returns to the home society. Uh, what I found was that when people talked about going back home, that for them, that's when they realized the real transformation occurred for them. Many of the people that I interviewed, they talked about how excited they were when they initially got back and how when they were living in the U.S., they just could not wait to get home. So some of the people that I interviewed, they came back because they felt like they completed their migration goal in terms of working and saving up enough money. Uh, some people came back because their health is they had health issues and they feel like they could get access to better health care in Brazil than in the U.S. at the time. And then some people that were undocumented, some had either been deported or were afraid that they were going to be deported. And so they decided to come back home before um, they wanted to for that reason. But many of them talked about how they didn't really recognize how much the U.S. migration had changed them or how much they had themselves, they felt that they changed until they came back to Brazil. Many of them, when they lived in the U.S., were living in predominantly Brazilian ethnic enclaves, working with other Brazilians, going to church with other Brazilians. So even though they were geographically in the U.S., they were still in Brazil for the most part. But they didn't realize until they went home how they'd been able to pick up subtle cultural cues and had become accustomed to particular things living in the United States. And for some people, they felt that they brought back racial ideals from the U.S. So, for instance, the importance of racial classification. People said, yep, in the U.S., everyone had, there are these categories, and you have to figure out where you fit. Some of the return migrants that I interviewed felt that when they came back to Brazil, they were trying to figure out what U.S. racial categories the Brazilians that they encountered would fit into. And so subconsciously, they were thinking about how race in the U.S. functioned, but in the context here of GV. And so, for instance, this particular uh, immigrant here, Felipe, who at the time when I first interviewed him, before he migrated, he thought of himself as completely white. By the time when I asked him in the interview, so now that I'm talking to you, how do you classify yourself? He's like, I see myself as white, but not 100% white, which gives you a sense of, for him, how his coming to the United States changed the way he saw the white racial category. And he feels that, yeah, I was white in Brazil before I left, but now that I've been to the U.S. and I see what the real white category is like, I'm not white in the same way as I was before. And this came about this nuanced perception from living in the U.S. In terms of thinking about the way racism exists and stratification, it was really interesting that people felt that the U.S. was more overtly racist than Brazil, so in terms of interactions that you had with people, but at the same time, they thought that regardless of what your racial group is in the U.S., there is more opportunity for social mobility in the U.S. compared to Brazil. And I thought this was very fascinating, and one of the ways that this came out in the data a lot was through the comparisons that Brazilians made between black Americans and black Brazilians, because in the United States, many, uh, um, Many of the Brazilians that I interviewed talked about encountering and observing middle class black families um, and blacks who were really well dressed and driving in really fancy cars. And also, in terms of watching television, they thought that in U.S. media that blacks had more of an elite presence compared to the black population in Brazil, which is often portrayed as uh, nannies, as housekeepers, as soccer, uh, soccer players, or in more stereotypical roles. And so, for the most part, Brazilians talked about the social mobility being increased in the U.S. through the lens or through their observations of middle-class black Americans. And when they got back to Brazil, seeing how 
black Brazilians were much more socially disadvantaged was um, highlighted because they had lived in the United States. And so Luis, who is a black immigrant that I interviewed, talked about how he feels that in uh, the U.S., black, op black Americans have far more opportunities than black Brazilians do, and that in the U.S., the U.S. society tends to value black, black Americans more than, uh, than they're valued in Brazilian society. So to conclude, in terms of thinking about the transnational racial optic, what I've shown in the book is that this process of migration through uh, this process of encountering another country, another context with different race relations, it leads, to, it leads to a transformation in the ways that people think about race. This process of moving across borders causes people to come into contact or allows people to come into contact with a different way of thinking about race, uh, particularly between the Brazilian and the U.S. context. And for these individuals, this process of migration creates this hybridized lens for thinking about race, such that when people get back to Brazil, they're not only thinking about race with the Brazilian frame of reference or a U.S. frame of reference, but a unique combination of the two. And this is an internal process that's ongoing for people in their daily lives as they're interacting with other people, as they're talking to folks, as they're also thinking about the readaptation process. How do I racially classify myself? How do I racially classify other people? And various factors influence the strength of this transnational racial optic for the people that I interviewed. And so in this project, I focus more particularly on Brazilian return migrants with regard to how they no negotiated racial classification, perceptions of stratification uh, and discrimination. But this might also have some influence on other migrants on the move, given that uh, global, migration, uh, um, global migration in the world is on an all-time high right now for various social, political, and economic reasons. And when people are moving between contexts and countries that are very different from each other, they use the frame of reference from their country of origin to help them figure out what or how to navigate the new context that they're living in. And race is one of the ways that people also do this through uh, the transnational racial optic. So to conclude, in terms of thinking about how Brazilians have been on the move uh, from, the United, from Brazil to the United States for the last 60 years, um, at the time that I was finishing up the book manuscript, the Brazilian economy was doing great. Uh, everyone was talking about Brazil as sort of this up-and-coming world superpower or economic power. Um, um, people were excited about the World Cup and the Olympics. And so the U.S. and other countries had started investing a lot in study abroad and international exchange programs in Brazil at that time. And so just as more people were on the move from Brazil in the earlier part, uh, or in the late 1900s and early 2000s, more Americans and people from other countries were starting to be on the move to go to Brazil. Um, and therefore, they would encounter the notions of race in Brazil. And as they were on the move, these racial ideals would continue to move and circulate between each country. Um, however, given a lot of the shifts that we're seeing in terms of what's happening in Brazil right now, um, we'll have to wait and see a couple more years how this process continues to play out. So uh, I'm going to stop there, and I'll go ahead and take questions. Thank you. Um, so this may be beyond the scope of the work that you did, um, but I'm kind of wondering in terms of uh, the changing perceptions of race, uh, the, the place that, that these migrants came from, GV. Um, so I'm wondering if you uh, at all studied or saw an impact in the perception of the, the native population who didn't migrate. So you said some like 15% of the population uh, from this uh, place, GV, are actually in the US. So you're talking about a place that has clearly a large migrant population mm -hmm. that is coming up to the Northeast and then returning. Um, in addition to that, obviously, US is a big cultural exporter. So as you said, you know they have access to US TV programs and so on. So with 
in so with that context with all these people going back is that impacting the perceptions of the people who've never come here mm -hmm. who are like friends neighbors whatever Yes, that's a good question. That's one that I do talk about in the book um, in the last couple of chapters. Um, I, w I have to say that one of the things that I was surprised about, um, or I guess I won't say that I was surprised about, but what I found in terms of the information, the findings with regard to the return migrants about their perceptions and experiences in the U.S., when I would ask non-migrants about the things that they heard about the U.S., they often mirrored what the return migrants told me, which indicated that the return migrants had been telling them about their experiences and that this was shaping the non-migrants' perceptions of um, race in the United States. But interestingly enough, uh, the non-migrants, it didn't seem that their perceptions of race were shifting in terms of thinking about the context of GV. And that was one of the things that I had wanted to, that I was, why I was interested in doing the research because I wanted to see with all this back and forth movement, is it changing discourses of race on the ground in the city, um, even among the non-migrants? And I didn't find any evidence of that. And in one of the book chapters, I talk about how that could be for a couple of reasons. One, um, it could be because um, one of the reasons it could be is because in Brazil, anything that's thought of as being associated with racism, people want to distance themselves from. So even if people noticed differences like people acting in a more racist way, no one would actually acknowledge it in the interviews. And so I say that because whenever I started to ask people about, well, how does racism exist in Brazil? Everyone would say, oh, I'm not racist, but racism was this thing that existed out there that I don't play any part in. Um, but people recognize that in Brazil, uh, blacks were very much socially disadvantaged, but no one was racist. Um, and so the, uh, in terms of the perception of Brazil as a racial democracy, people are very quick to deny having any sort of overtly racist behavior. They'll say, I like everyone. And I think, or I talk about in the book chapter, how this, if there were any sorts of ways that uh, GV was changing in that regard, that I don't think people would have openly <laughs> admitted it to me. Um, and just from my observations of walking around and living in the city, I did find that there were certainly differences in the ways that people were treated, particularly where people lived um, in the city, and that was very much stratified by race or skin color, if you will, although non-migrants didn't notice that to the same extent that return migrants did. So what I found was that return migrants became much more attuned to the nuanced, more subtle ways that discrimination and inequality worked in Brazil because of the experiences that they'd had living in the US where the non-migrants could not quite talk about or provide to have the language to explain observing similar behavior. And so that was the big difference I found. The return migrants could pick up on the more subtle nuances, but the non-migrants could not. And um, the return migrants were able to actually call these things out and actually give them names and say, well, this reminds me of when I lived in the US seeing the position of black Brazilians here. Um, and so that was the biggest difference I found between the return migrants and the non-migrants in terms of non-migrants not exhibiting, bringing back these US racial ideals, if that makes sense. So I have a related question mm -hmm. to you backing on that idea. So, um, you know the concept of social remittances that they have. Yes. Have. So it seems like you're not seeing that happen because you said you don't see some of these ideas taking hold mm -hmm. in Brazil. At least at that particular time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, did you see darker skinned um, return migrants trying to argue for why they need to have, or Brazil needs to um, have a better, I don't know. Mm -hmm. system so that darker skin immigrants, darker skin people could move up because mm -hmm. you said that was one contrast that they made. Mm -hmm. And then another question is how did the brown skin immigrants locate themselves in the US? You talked about the lighter skin and the darker skin, but how about the brown skin? How did they locate themselves in the US? Was it just a Hispanic or you know racially how did they locate themselves? Okay, thank you. So I'll start with the uh, 
your last question about brown skin uh, migrants. Most of those people ended up self-classifying in the Hispanic or the Latino category when they were in the US. So since they were par due or racially mixed in Brazil, I can go back to, um, actually have a, another slide there. Uh, with the U.S. and the post-migration classifications. Uh, most of the individuals who were brown-skinned or classified as uh, Pardu before migrating, they primarily classified as Hispanic or Latino. Um, and so for those individuals, since they were in an intermediate category, they sort of knew that they were not white in the United States. The biggest transformation, or I guess movement in terms of classification was for the people who thought of themselves as white in Brazil and got to the US and learned that they were not after experiencing discrimination or realizing, well, compared to white Americans who are really, really white, that was the language I would hear people say, I'm not white. So it's um, the brown skinned or the Pardu Brazilians, because they were already somewhat in the middle in terms of phenotype, the Hispanic or Latino classification was more uh, logical for them. Mm -hmm. And so that was less of a shift for them. I mean, as you clarify, it's not just about the classification, mm -hmm. the experiences here. Mm -hmm. I mean, did they feel that they, they were discriminated against because of the color of their skin compared to the lighter skin and the darker skin? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so in terms of those individuals, they felt that if they experienced discrimination, that it was more tied to them being an immigrant um, and also being racialized as Latino or Hispanic. So not necessarily because of their actual skin color, but because they were being associated with another marginalized, negatively stereotyped group. And so in the book, I talk about how Brazil, how the people I interviewed navigated or how they thought about the Latino and Hispanic categories and how when they got to the US, they internalized very quickly how Latinos were very much stigmatized and Mexican Americans specifically um, as Hispanics. And so they wanted to socially distance themselves in that regard. I will say that people felt that once they told Americans, white Americans, that they were Brazilian, they felt that they were treated better, that they got better social treatment after they disclosed that I'm Brazilian, I'm not like those other Latinos or Hispanics. Um, and so that was the case for the brown skin, uh, for the brown skinned Brazilians, and also for the uh, white, the people who classified as white before. They felt that they were treated better if they uh, identified as Brazilian versus letting people think that they were Latino or Hispanic. For the black Brazilians that I interviewed, uh, many of them because they were dark enough to pass for quote unquote black in the US, um, many people a lot of times did not think they were Brazilian or Latino. And so I have a couple of anecdotes in the book where I talk about how they had um, their relationships with the black American community were a little bit tenuous because even though they looked black, they spoke English with an accent, the ones who did speak English, or um, they were from Latin America. And so there is more research that's being done now that sort of, sort of talks about the um, marginalization that black Latinos feel in the United States because they're racialized as black, so they're not fully accepted by Latinos. But then because they're Latino, they're not fully accepted by the black or quote unquote African American community. Um, and to go back to your first question about, yeah, I guess that ties into your question about the darker skinned uh, Brazilians in terms of their social treatment in the US. Um, as I said, some of them could pass for black or African American. Um, and some of them certainly felt that even among other Brazilian immigrants in the US, this stigma of um, being darker would lead to experiences of discrimination. So I have another quote in the book where this black Brazilian immigrant I interviewed talks about how a white Brazilian friend of his was telling him about this job and how the boss would not hire him because he was black. Um, and then his friend ended up getting the job from this white American boss. And so that was an example of the way that the skin color differences between Brazilians would play out here in the United States as well, too. Um, so I enjoyed your talk very much. Um, so you sort of um, implicitly talk about sort of the politicization of identities when you mm -hmm. say that from one of the quotes that a Brazilian observed that there was more racial pride mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, 
I, and also seem to observe at the same time that there's more social mobility. So there's a black middle class that he, he or she doesn't observe in Brazil. So I was kind of curious as to whether you talked to any, I mean, there's a large black movement yes. in Brazil, right? Yes. And so I wondered if you sort of tried to get into sort of politicized identities by talking to people who are part of that movement. Mm -hmm. And also whether you might consider um, the difference between the GV and the north of Brazil, where there's, you know, a concentration of dark-skinned mm -hmm. blacks. Yes, those are very good questions. So in the context of GV, uh, where I was living, there was not much of a presence of the black movement there. And I think, again, that's tied to the demographics of the region in terms of most of the population, either classifying as Pardu um, in a smaller, uh, the next uh, largest percent under which people classify as white. So the black population in GV was much smaller. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why the black movement was what the black movement was not as present there, at least when I was doing my field work there. Um, and so that wasn't something that came up as much in the interviews, except for, I would say, maybe a couple of the black Brazilians that I interviewed. They weren't involved in the black movement, they, but they had a very strong black racial identity. And they talked a lot about, from a very young age, um, experiencing discrimination and realizing that this whole notion of Brazil as a racial democracy was a lie. I mean, that was actually some of the language that they used. And one of them uh, actually was like a sociology professor at the local university, and he talked extensively about how, yes, even though I'm well, you know, I'm well educated, I experienced discrimination here in Brazil, like from the time I was a kid and kids, uh, from the time I was a child, and children would like tease me in school and call me a monkey and things like that. So, so some of the, uh, the two of the four uh, black Brazilians or people who self-identified as black um, had a very strong sense of black racial identity, although they didn't tell me whether or not they had any ties to the black movement in other parts of the country. But in GV, there wasn't much of a movement. Um, in terms of thinking about the northeastern US, uh, the north, I'm sorry, northeastern Brazil, um, there's actually a book that came out uh, recently by another sociologist, uh, Elizabeth Horge Freeman, where she actually looks, uh, does research in Salvador, the Bahia, which is where there's this large history of, uh, or where there's this large presence of uh, black Brazilians because this is actually where the slaves were brought uh, directly from Africa. And she looks at how uh, notions of blackness play out in Salvador among families as they're raising their children and when there are differences in phenotype within the same family, how that makes a difference. And what she talks about is how even though this blackness is something that is a commodity uh, within the tourist industry and that there is a black movement within Salvador, that even still within these families, the ways in which people are treated very differently based on whether one sibling is darker or lighter, that there is a lot of angst around phenotype, around skin color and hair texture, even in the presence of, um, of this strong sense of blackness and black identity, which is often found in Salvador. And then there's also work that's being done, c c comparative work that's being, or has been done by Tiana Paschal, um, looking at the black movement um, in Brazil and also in Colombia and how those notions play out too in terms of black identity. But again, given the context where I was located since I was there, that didn't come out as much in the data, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was wondering if you found any differences in experiences based on the location where they migrated to in the host country? Mm -hmm. Yes, so most of the people that I interviewed lived in the northeastern U.S. Um, a couple of the people spent some time in Florida before then moving to the northeast. And then I interviewed a few people who lived in like Virginia or the Maryland area. And it was interesting to talk to them because particularly the um, no, Virginia and North Carolina and Maryland. And it was interesting to talk to those people because in terms of thinking about the difference in demographics, but also the discourses of race between the North and the South, 
these notions came up in some of the interviews, particularly for one of the women that I interviewed who lived in North Carolina, which had, which in the last, I guess now it's been about 20 years, has had a huge influx of Mexican migration. And she talked about trying to navigate what it meant to be uh, Latino um, in a context where this highly marginalized Hispanic population or Mexicans lives and trying to socially distance herself from that, but at the same time, some of the blatantly racist things she heard in the company of white Americans that she was living around or with because her boyfriend at the time was a white American. And she would talk about how these people would have these conversations about how they didn't want certain people coming into their neighborhoods or in their families, and usually they meant blacks. Um, and so it was interesting to get her perspective because in terms of the Latino Hispanic issue, the group of reference for her was Mexicans, whereas the people who lived in other parts of the US, it was either other Brazilians or Dominicans or Puerto Ricans because the Mexican population in the Northeast is not as big as it is, let's say, in California or Texas. So the discourse is around what it means to be Latino or Hispanic and then how black-white relations are certainly differed for her being in the context or the people who were in the context of the South compared to the people who were in the Northeastern US. And in and, and the future, if I'm able to, I would love to be able to do uh, research in uh, Georgia where there's a large Brazilian immigrant uh, uh, enclave, um, I believe in the Marietta area, just to get a sense of some of the differences too, being in that context compared mm -hmm. to the Northeast, where I'm doing research now. Uh, oops. <laughs> okay, yeah, her and then. Sure. <laughs> Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I have a question um, sort of about um, the social justice movement and privileges. So mm -hmm. you mentioned that these survivors that come here have you know, that are or have a, a catastrophe be classified as in their own country moving to the United States have that disrupted. And so their whatever advantages they thought they had in Brazil as whites gets sort of disrupted. Mm -hmm. So I, I was the question I have is kind of related to a comment you made that said the immigrant felt that blacks had more opportunities in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether or not the the darker skinned um, immigrants felt as if there was a sort of social disruption of disadvantage. So that they mm -hmm. came here and felt like they had more privileges as sort of black people than they would have had in their own country. So I just wonder if you could speak to that. Yes, for that sure. Um, so in one of the chapters of the book I talk, I spent a, quite a bit of time talking about sort of the, the um, these perceptions of black Americans mm -hmm. um, that respondents had, not only in terms of the socioeconomic position, like there being a sizable black middle class here compared to Brazil where people felt like there wasn't one, um, but also perceptions that uh, the black American population was more politically active, but at the same time, people thought that black Americans were more racist than black Brazilians. So it was interesting because they were, on, on, on two ways, they were talking about how they really admired that black Americans had fought during the Civil Rights Movement um, to be able to sort of have the positioning that they had in US society. But at the same time, they talked about how they felt that blacks were self-segregating, lived in separate neighborhoods, went to separate churches, went to separate schools, which I thought was really fascinating because the Brazilians also went to separate churches, lived in separate neighborhoods, and the behaviors that they were singling out black Americans for, they were also participating in. And when I would ask, well, how is it, do you think that self-segregating or racist, and people would say no. And I would try to probe them and ask them, well, what's the difference? And people would get like really quiet or they were not able to answer the question. And I think part of that was because they realized that, they might have realized that they were also <laughs> being racist in the ways that they were saying that black Americans were. Um, so in that regard, it was interesting for them to have these different perceptions of black Americans at the same time. But to get to your point about black Brazilians, um, they did in some ways feel much more marginalized um, than black Americans because one, in one way they weren't US citizens. So some of the, most of, yeah, three of the four black Brazilians that I interviewed were undocumented at some point. So clearly immigration status is something that 
very much disadvantaged, nearly most of the people that I interviewed. But that was another way in which uh, the black Brazilians I interviewed were disadvantaged relative to black Americans. And then also the types of opportunities, or they didn't have access to the same types of opportunities um, in Brazil that some of the black Americans that they'd encountered had um, here in the US. So for instance, one of the black uh, Brazilian women that I interviewed, she talked about actually cleaning houses for like, a, she was a house cleaner in the US. And she talked about cleaning houses for this black family and how uh, she thought they were really racist because they lived in this huge house and there were only other black people in the neighborhood. And they would say things like, oh, we don't like white people and things like that. And so in that particular moment, she was certainly distancing herself from them, but she was certainly much more structurally disadvantaged than the people whose houses she was cleaning in that particular instance, a black American family. Um, and so the issue of documentation status or of not being a citizen here definitely highlighted the marginalization that people felt because they were more vulnerable, not only in terms of being black, but also in terms of being immigrant. And then when people went back to Brazil, that just highlighted the marginalization even more because they had seen what could be possible in the United States in terms of the black middle class that they observed, and then not seeing that when they got back to Brazil. So to some extent, there was this double marginalization that people realized that these black Brazilians recognized um, in terms of being even more structurally disadvantaged, particularly after going back to Brazil and having had that experience living in the US seeing black Americans in movies, seeing them driving really nice cars, dressed really nicely, because in Brazil, uh, social appearance is everything. Um, the way you're dressed, the way you present yourself, people put a lot more into that. So people will make a lot of comments about how well put together black Americans were compared to black Brazilians. Follow up mm -hmm. question? Sure. Did the black Brazilians feel as though they um, had a better experience in the U.S. versus Brazil. Like, I mean, they were marginalized to mm -hmm. like, relative to blacks of America. But I'm just wondering, you know. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because um, in terms of the black Brazilians, not only them, but some of the other return migrants I interviewed talked about how um, after living in the U.S., they became more aware or conscious of the rights that people had. So they said they felt like they appreciated that in the U.S. that people would fight for their rights. If people were discriminated against, they would file a lawsuit. And they said that that was something that they really appreciated seeing and that when they came back to Brazil, where they could participate as full citizens, that they would not allow anyone to mistreat them anymore. And so there's this anecdote um, that I mentioned in the book about this woman who talks about, she's like, yeah, I will not let anyone mistreat me anymore. If I go to, let's say, the city hall or somewhere where I'm paying taxes and I'm paying the salary of the person working there, I won't let them talk to me in any kind of way or discriminate against me or mistreat me. So people had very much this perception of, they felt like they learned that they had rights in the US, although they couldn't practice that in the US because of their documentation status. When they got back to Brazil, they wanted to take uh, to become more involved in civic life in terms of responses to discrimination or mistreatment, social mistreatment of any kind, which I found really fascinating, too. Did you still have? Thank you. OK. Did you still have a question? If there's time, are we, I think we're probably out of time, so. Yeah. OK. Oh, we're probably out of That's time. That's fine.